Uh, welcome everyone to this week Autonomy Talks. This week is a pleasure to have Christopher Bergman, who is a PhD student in the Division of Automatic Control in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Linköping University. Hope I spelled it correctly. So Christopher actually is on a very hot week. Uh, tomorrow we'll define his PhD. So we see today as a chance to see <laughs> uh, without pressure <laughs> what he's, he's going <laughs> to present tomorrow. Um, so Christopher works under the supervision of the Professor Daniel Exil. Uh, something about him, he received a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and uh, a License of Engineering degree in Automatic Control, both from Linköping University and currently also working as a System Engineer at Saab Dynamics. His research interests include motion planning, optimization and optimal control and he applies these techniques to complex dynamical systems that operate in unstructured environments. And uh, we are very happy to hear what you're going to talk about. The stage is yours. All right. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. The title of my talk is Tightly Combining Sampling-Based Motion Planning and Direct Optimal Control, where I will present the majority of work that I've been doing as a PhD student. The results have been de developed in collaboration with Dr. Oskar Jungqvist, a former PhD student at our group, my co-supervisor, Professor Torkel Glad, and my main supervisor, Associate Professor Daniel Axehill. So before I start, I will briefly go through some personal background. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Division of Automatic Control in Linköping University in Sweden. I'm a part of the Wallenberg AI Autonomous Systems and Software Program, which is by far the largest individual research initiative ever in Sweden. And as stated earlier, my main research topic is optimization-based motion planning techniques. And I will defend my thesis tomorrow with Professor Fasoli as the opponent. So my research have mainly focused on system with complex dynamics operating in unstructured environments where there are no reference, such as the lane of the road to follow. So some example scenarios that we will get back to later in this talk are maritime navigation of ships, such as docking in harbors, and autonomous parking of tractor trailer vehicles, which operates in restricted areas. In such scenarios, it is of high importance to consider limited maneuvering capabilities of the involved systems to be able to plan safe motions. So to define uh, the motion planning problem, we let X denote the state of the system and U is the control input. The motion, is, uh, the motion of the system is governed by a differential equation, X dot equals to F of X and U. The motion planning problem can then be described as finding state and control input trajectories X of T and U of T, where the state trajectory brings the system from the initial state X0 to a goal state XF at capital time T. Furthermore, the trajectories shall satisfy all state and input constraints, which are captured by the sets X3 and calligraphic U. So the most commonly used motion planner to solve these type of problems are sampling based, such as RRT and state lattice. The main difference between these methods is that RRT based planners are based on randomized exploration and online expansion, expansion using a so-called steering function, which leads to tree based searches. On the other hand, a state lattice planner uses a deterministic sampling strategy that is determined offline before the problems are solved. And then standard graph search can be used to solve the motion planning problems. So the main benefit with these type of methods, which is probably why they are so popular, are that they are able to handle differential constraints, such as the one that I mentioned earlier. They are very flexible in, with respect to collision avoidance. All that is needed is, is basically a function that returns if the current, current state is in collision or not. And finally, they are able to explore the search space globally, which means that they make discrete decisions implicitly, such as selecting on which side to pass an obstacle. 
the main drawback with these methods are that it, it's difficult or rather computationally expensive to optimize solutions. For RRT star, the optimization is done using a rewiring step. And this procedure can be expensive, for example, when the steering function that connects two states is non-trivial to compute. And for a state lattice, it would require to increase the fidelity of the state space discretization. This leads to more motion primitives to expand in each step and also a longer time to find this resolution optimal solution. So as you might understand, we are not only interested in finding a feasible solution, but also a solution that optimizes some kind of performance measure. And from a control perspective, the optimal motion planning problem is actually an instance of an optimal control problem. So using the previous definition of a motion planning problem, a mathematical representation of the optimal version is given here as an optimal control problem. And here L defines the performance measure, which is to be minimized. And this problem can be solved using, for example, direct methods for optimal control. And the main benefit with these methods are that they scale better in higher dimension when searching for optimized solutions. So why not use these methods instead of sampling-based planning? So to provide an answer to this question, I will first discuss some properties of direct methods for optimal control. So in these methods, the infinite dimensional optimal control problem is discretized to a finite nonlinear programming or NLP problem. And this can then be solved using standard NLP techniques. Methods for solving NLPs use an iterative approach where a search direction in each iteration is computed using first and second order derivatives. For convex optimization problems, these methods can be used to compute, compute globally optimal solutions. But what is required for an optimization problem to be convex? So first of all, the performance measure needs to be convex. And one such example is to use a quadratic function L. And then the linear or the equality constraints need to be linear. In our case, this does not hold since the differential constraints are nonlinear. And finally, the feasible region should be convex. And again, this does not hold since the obstacles make the feasible region non-convex. And a non-convex region means that it's not guaranteed that it's possible to draw a straight line between two feasible points where all points on the line are feasible. So the fact that we do not have linear equality constraints and a convex feasible region gives us that the problem we want to solve are non-convex. And for non-convex problems, standard NLP can be used to find locally optimal solutions. But the quality of this solution heavily depends on the starting point or the initialization of the problem. So as shown here in this simple one-dimensional ex example, starting the search for a solution within the red region here will make the algorithm to find that is solution that is far from the globally optimal one down here. And moreover, for problems that we are interested in, it is not even guaranteed that the algorithms are able to converge to a solution at all from starting points far from a locally optimal solution. So with this at, as motivation, we have proposed a motion planner that tightly combines a lattice-based motion planner and an optimization-based so-called improvement step. So the first step finds a dynamically feasible solution by concatenating segments from a pre-computed library of motion primitives. It solves the combinatorial aspects of the problem such as selecting on which side to pass an obstacle. But on the downside, the solution often suffer from discretization artifacts that arises from the limited amount of motion primitives. So the solution from the lattice planner is then used as initialization to the second optimization-based improvement step, which solves the problem to local optimality by utilizing 
that it's not restricted to the discrete set of motion primitives. So what do we mean by tightly combine? By using the same nonlinear system model and the same performance measure in both steps, the sampling base planner is able to provide the second step with, first of all, a feasible initialization, which means that it is guaranteed that there exists a solution. And secondly, a well-informed warm start. And this means that the second step will converge faster to a solution. And this is something that we show both theoretically and practically in our transaction on intelligent vehicle paper that it re referenced here. To put this in a motion planning context, this illustrative example show the importance of using a well-informed initialization. So the dashed yellow line here represents an initialization based on a simplified model that disregards the system dynamics. From this initialization, it is impossible for the optimal control algorithm to converge to a feasible solution. And this is avoided in the case when the nonlinear system model is considered already in the first step. So adding this second step will naturally increase the computational burden. And one approach to reduce this increase is to apply the second step in a receding horizon fashion. This will lead to a reduced latency, which means that the execution of the motion can start faster. Furthermore, since there are uncertainties present, such as modeling errors, environmental disturbances, and unidentified obstacles, we might need to replan in the future. So this means that it's most important to improve the trajectory in a vicinity of the current state. So at each RHP iteration K, an optimization problem is solved over a sliding time window, TK to TK plus T. And we let X bar K and U bar K denote a full horizon trajectory from the initial state to the terminal state after iteration K. And these will be used both for warm starting, but also to ensure stability and convergence in the second step. To show how this full horizon trajectory is utilized, uh, the RHP problem is posed as an OCP. We can see that it's quite similar to the original optimal motion planning problem, but with some important modifications. So first of all, we have added tau k, which has replaced the terminal time as a decision variable. It is considered as a timing variable and is used to select where to connect on the previous full horizon trajectory, x bar k minus one, given as the terminal condition here in the OCP. And we note that x bar minus one is the initial trajectory from the sampling based motion planner in the first step. The timing variable is also used to determine the cost to go from the state at the end of the horizon to the desired goal state xf, which makes it possible to optimize where to connect on this x bar k minus one. And the cost to go is defined by the previous solution and represents an admissible upper limit of the cost to reach XF from a state in X bar K minus one. So this might be easier to grasp by using an illustrative example. So assume that at iteration K and time TK, the blue line here represents the previously obtained trajectory from the current state to XF. Then the pro problem is solved and the resulting optimized trajectory is given by the green line, which has a final state here. Since the initial blue part and the green part differ, it was possible here to improve the first part of the blue trajectory. The remaining part here marked with an orange dotted line represents how to reach the goal state XF from the state at the end of the RHP solution. This means that the new full horizon trajectory after iteration K, X bar K, 
is given by concatenating the green and the orange part, which is then used as input to the next RHP iteration. And we note here that the time shift delta TK is used in the definition. And it's given by the difference between the timing parameter tau and the planning horizon. And this loop continues until the terminal state has been reached. So using this tight combination of methods that was described earlier, we are able to provide theoretical guarantees on recursive feasibility, worst case objective function value, and convergence to the terminal state for the second receding horizon step. And details for this are given in our paper to IFAC World, World Congress last summer. And these three stability aspects are often non-trivial for receding horizon approaches applied to these type of problems. So now I will present some numerical results for two different motion planning scenarios where we have applied this method. The first scenario is a challenging parking scenario for a truck and trailer, tractor trailer vehicle. The model of the vehicle is given here to the left, which consists of a truck, a dolly and a trailer. And the more details about the model is given here. So we can see that it consists of seven states in total and is based on a kinematic model of a general two trailer with a car like truck. And as you can see, the model is highly nonlinear. Furthermore, due to the dolly in the model, this model is actually not differentially flat. So offline, we compute a library of motion primitives. These motion primitives are optimized by solving a number of OCPs that connect different states in a discrete search space. And for this, we have developed an optimization-based motion primitive generation framework uh, that is uh, referenced here. And these motion primitives are then concatenated online in a graph search using, for example, A star or R star in the search for a solution. And here I will present the results that evaluates the effect of the planning horizon T in the RHP step in terms of objective function value, computation time, and time to reach the terminal or the goal state XF, which is the total time to plan and execute the motion. So this plot shows the results from two different initial states in a reverse parking scenario. So the blue line is the solution from the lattice-based planner. The green line is the solution when the full horizon is approved at once. And the orange line represents the solution obtained when using a planning horizon of T equals 60 seconds. So this movie illustrates how the receding horizon step improves the initial blue solution. Here, the results for a horizon of t equals 40 seconds is shown. And note here that the vehicle always reaches the full horizon solution here, the blue one, at the end of the horizon. And when the horizon increases, we see that it's possible to completely remove this initial segment, which is caused by the limited amount of motion primitives. So the receding horizon step instead starts to reverse directly and is thus able to reach the terminal state much faster. So if we dig a bit deeper in the details, and the plot here to the right shows how the objective function value is decreased with an increased planning horizon, which is summarized on this row in the table. We note that the objective function value is significantly decreased already for short horizons, but after a certain horizon, roughly t equals 80 seconds in this case, no further uh, improvement is obtained. So to conclude, uh, we get significantly improved trajectories obtained by adding this second step. 
The plot here also shows how the computation time increases with an increased horizon. And the dashed line represents the first iteration, which is usually takes longer time. And this is since the warm start from the lattice planner is worse than what is obtained in the subsequent RHP iterations. So the first iteration will usually take longer time. And from these results, we can see that there is a trade-off between solution quality and latency. So a similar results are obtained for this parallel parking scenario. But in this example, it is possible in average to improve the trajectory from the lattice planner even more. So here we can see more than 40% when approaching this full horizon improvement case. And this is probably due to a more constrained environment in this example. So secondly, we have compared the average difference in total time to reach the terminal state with and without the RHP step. And it's given by the green line here. This number represents the total execution time of the motion plus the latency time for the computation of the first iteration. And it's given here on the second line. So we see that there is a sweet spot somewhere around planning horizons of 60 to 80 seconds. And this can be explained by the fact that the computation time continues to increase with an in increased planning horizon, but after a certain horizon length, no significant improvement is obtained. So it only leads to an increased latency. So as a general conclusion, we see that the terminal state is reached faster with the second step, even though the second step adds computational effort. So the second scenario that I wanted to show relates to motion planning for marine vessels. The considered problem here is to enable autonomous navigation in, for example, harbors and archipelagos when other marine vessels are present. The, algorithms, the algorithm must then be able to account for the complex dynamics of the vessel and also to obey the rules in the international regulations for preventing collisions at sea, which is commonly referred to as COLREX. So the question we were asking us if, is if it would be possible to handle such problems in a similar two-step approach. The model of the ship is described using the state's eta, which is the position and the heading of the ship, and nu, which are the body fixed velocities. And finally, the ship is configured with two thrusters whose angles and velocities are considered as states in the model. And the control input to the model are the angle and velocity derivatives for the thrusters. So this gives in total 10 states and four control inputs. And, and these can be used to express the equations for the dynamics of the ship. And they are based on rigid body dynamics and hydrodynamics and are derived in detail in Fossen's handbook of marine craft hydrodynamics and motion control. And I will only briefly go through them here. So the first equation represents the kinematics, where R is the rotation matrix. And the second one represents the kinetics, where M is the inertia matrix. And this term is the Coriolis term. And here we have the damping terms. And finally, tau is the forces and moments generated by the thrusters. And these uh, forces and moments are mainly given by the propeller, but at higher speeds, the rudders on the thrusters also generate forces that are acting on the ship that needs to be considered. And these equations together can compactly be written on this traditional form x dot equals to f of x and u. So the call rigs specifies in total 41 rules that are applicable in different scenarios at sea. But in this work, and as in many other works, we limit to consider rule 8 and rule 13 to 17. And these Colreg rules can be broken down into a number of corresponding Colreg situations. 
and the following are of interest in our work. So the first one is safe, which means that there is no collision situation that is active. The second one is a head-on situation, where, <clears throat> which is illustrated here. And here we see that another vessel is approaching us uh, in front of us, and uh, the conceptual behavior is then to yield to the right. And the second scenario is illustrated here and is a giveaway scenario, which happens when the other vessel is approaching us from the right. And in this case, we should pass behind the other vessel. And the third scenario is a stand-on scenario, which is the opposite of a giveaway. So it means that the other vessel is approaching us from the left. And in this case, we should continue with our speed and uh, heading and the other vessel should yield. And finally, in an overtaking scenario, we're allowed to overtake the other vessel either to the left or to the right. These situations are implemented using a finite state machine for each nearby vessel. An important question is then when to switch between states. So in our work and in many other works, uh, we switch between choleric states based on a closest point of approach measure or CPA. In such an approach, both position and velocity information are used to compute the distance at CPA and the time to reach CPA as illustrated here in this figure. If these values are below or above certain thresholds, a switch will occur. And we have also added hysteresis to avoid that you switch fast between states. And the color rig scenarios are handled in the motion planner by augmenting the lattice based planner with discrete color rig states discussed on the previous slide. So each color rig state is then associated with a specific cost or a forbidden region which is what we have been using. The one used in our work can be seen here in the figure, and they are designed such that the vessel should obey these call rig rules. So the second step is then to solve the problem to local optimality with these discrete call rig states fixed. So here we see an example of a giveaway scenario where the other vessel is approaching from the left or well, from the right. Due to a limited amount of motion primitives, we can see here that the lattice planner, the dashed solution here, is a bit oscillatory instead of slowing down. But uh, the receding horizon planner is able to reduce these oscillations and instead slows down. And here we can see when the ship enters the state giveaway and it successfully avoids this orange forbidden region. And we also illustrate here an overtaking scenario. So another important result is illustrated on, in these figures. So here we see when a narrow passage is not occupied, the algorithm will find a route through this narrow passage. However, in the case when another vessel is occupying this passage, the algorithm instead selects a route on the other side of the island and is thus able to proactively avoid a complex choleric situation. This behavior is not possible for hierarchical approaches, which most of the related work are based on. Such approaches first computes a nominal solution, such as waypoints to follow without considering moving vessels, and then uses an extra layer for reactive Colrex compliance. So to conclude, I have presented a tightly coupled two-step approach for motion planning. In the first step, a sampling-based motion planner is used, which is followed by an optimization-based so-called improvement step. 
the tight combination of methods make it possible to provide theoretical guarantees for the second step in terms of feasibility and worst case objective function value. We also showed how the second step can be applied in a receding horizon fashion, where the length of the horizon is used to trade off between quality and latency. And finally, I presented results from two different challenging motion planning scenarios for both uh, tractor trailer vehicles and marine vessels. So some topics for future research are, first of all, how to consider environmental disturbances already in the planning phase, such as winds and ocean currents in an efficient way. This will probably require the use of another sampling based motion planner than a state lattice planner. Secondly, is it possible to combine this approach with learning-based MPC? So for example, when some of the model parameters are unknown or varies over time. And thirdly, can similar ideas be used for combined task and motion planning? And this relates to, for example, to integrate the motion planner in a temporal logic or PDDL-based planner. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and open up for questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Uh, very nice work. And of course, I've, I've been reading the thesis and looking at your material, so I'm kind of familiar with, uh, with, with a lot of these things. Now, um, one question that I have is, in the correct case, how do you make sure that the state so if i understand correctly is you figure out what is the correct state that you should be in based on the graph on the lattice planner right yeah exactly and then you impose that um as a, as a constraint as a forbidden region right yeah for the optimization mm. but if you do that, then is it the case that the correct state may actually be different in the optimization rather than in the uh, in, in the lattice solution? Uh, I the way I implemented it is, or the way we think about it, is that the lattice planner makes all these discrete decisions, and the when when the optimization based planner takes All right. I understand right but uh, so if you go back you know show maybe the you know there you have some showing the the kind of constraint that you impose right so um, okay so if i understand correctly the giveaway scenario the second one then you want to pass behind the other guy right the other exactly guy. Now, but the constraint that I have here is this forbidden region, you know, doesn't prevent my ship to go to the left, right? You mean this one? Yeah. No, that, no, that's, so that uh, you, you need to design these, uh, I, I've shrink, they have been shrinking to fit this figure, but you need to design them such that it's very, very costly to, to take this other route and the other, the, the only, yeah, feasible solution should actually be to go behind, but on the yeah. other hand, you 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 yeah. still you still you still want. We have used forbidden region because it's better suiting the the other framework that we've been using. But you should use costs, right? Because if there are no possible way that you can go past this behind here, you you won't you will not. I will reduce the feasible region by in introducing these forbidden regions, but they are not forbidden in a, in a sense. I mean, these ones are designed by me and they are not part of the rules, so. Okay, but, but in a sense, uh, I mean, you, you, have kind of, you have determined that this should be a giveaway scenario because you already have a solution you know, from the mm -hmm. lattice that yeah. where your ship passes behind the other one, right? So yeah, so and and the optimization-based solver will never yeah. find a solution a that goes yeah. in this yeah. direction, because yeah. since it's it's only working locally, it will never be able to go through this region and then end up in another class of solution. What if 
there is no solution in your lab days that yeah. <laughs> that is fit any of this, uh, this compatible with any of these situations. Then you yeah, that the one is uh, is something that we haven't handled yet, actually. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm. because it, because in a sense, you know, given the final resolution that you have, you know, you I mean, clearly, you know, this is not complete, right? Yeah. And you may have a solution there. Yeah. Uh, okay. And the case you you do have an emergency mode, right? So what is the emergency mode? Well, we have an emergency mode, but I haven't been able i hadn't okay, okay. implemented it yet <laughs> the future uh, work okay yeah but i i, <laughs> okay. I might uh, need to do that to get the paper except because this one is submitted so it's under review <laughs> okay. and i got comments on it last week so okay okay or you know some... the abandoned ship case <laughs> 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 just jump overboard okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay cool Thanks. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I can tell you how I exp or how, how I'm planning to implement this emergency mode. Okay. So when when the ship enters emergency mode, what you want to do is to stop as fast as possible. So if you have a number of motion primitives that are like safe stop maneuvers, then you could use a specific type of library for, for that situation. That would be one way to handle emergency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in a sense, you would add the emergency stop to your set of maneuvers anyway. Right? Exactly, uh -huh. yeah. Um, but isn't um, the, um, the the stop maneuver also subject to quite advanced planning? I mean, it's not just a simple. I mean, you can design motion primitives that you say, okay, I want to end up in a state where the velocity is zero, and then you can yeah, have yeah, like yeah, exactly yeah you can design I, I just, several of those. Perhaps and... I misheard that it, it was supposed to be a primitive. I mean that that's my at least my my idea that it should be a, a motion primitive that takes you to a zero velocity state in in several ways that maybe is not isn't a part of the original primitive set because that would increase the computational effort. Well, uh, Christopher, uh, one thing that I actually was wondering while reading the uh, you know the, the work now. Uh, so you formulate the problem as you know where you have you know dynamics you know you have x dot is equal to f of x and u right mm -hmm. so it's a rather general you know model now but when you talk about your state lattice it seems to me that the state lattice is only in terms of the configuration so it makes me think of a kinematic kind of approach Right. Yeah. So, in particular, and you know, and um, you know, which could be fine when you're talking about the, um, you know, tractor and trailer, or you know, a car. Well, you're not dealing with cars; you have the tractor and trailer. Right? But um, I find it questionable for a ship. Yeah, we're we're actually using the full dynamical model. Yeah, yeah, I understand, but uh, then for the ship in in the motion primitives as well, in the motion primitive, but then also in the state lattice. So then I imagine exactly. that the state lattice is not only x, y, and heading, but it's also x, y, heading, speed, um, mm. you know, like a sideways yeah. you know, component of the speed, and you know, like there's a whole lot yeah. of other things. It is, and but but what we're doing is, is that we try to reduce so yeah it scales badly in the number of states right. so we limit the the number of states that we discretize when we design the state lattice planner and that is also one reason why we need to improve the solution afterwards because 
to be able to compute a solution, we restrict quite massively what, what can be done by this lattice planner. But we still use the full dynamical model. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I was, was thinking about that and, you know, you could probably, you know, say things like, well, like, like a ships typically have some cruising speed, right? Yeah. Uh, and typically ships don't like to go with a, like, like a big yaw angle, right? No. Uh, especially if you're traveling at speed, you know, and well, hmm. I'm thinking of sailboats, right? So on this, on these big ships, you don't have a keel, right? But, uh, but the, the ship is very long. So I think that you have, you know, pretty big directional stability in a sense. So you probably yeah. would be skidding sideways uh, too much. Um, but then you kind of had to enforce that in the, when you do the primitive computations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. we are limited in the nodes, right, Christopher? But uh, in the motion primitives, when we move from one node to another one, then we can explore, I mean, the entire flexibility in the states, right. so to say. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, but we are still, uh, I mean, we, to be able to do that efficiently, we reduce the search space quite, yeah. from, yeah. from 10 yeah. states to, I think it's six states that we discretize mm -hmm. or something. So, but we still are able to explore all states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I may, one you know, now that I have you here, um, um, you didn't present the, the part on the homotopy, right? No, so, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> any special reason? <laughs> no, but I thought it would be. It's a bit. It's not super related to this, and I thought it would be. It's a more clear presentation if I just stick to one, and I wouldn't want okay. to go into details on, on all my, but maybe I should have added that as well. Okay, 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 cool. But if um, you have any questions, you're free to ask. Um, it's, it's okay, but, uh, but yeah, so, so it is true that it's a little bit disconnected, right? Because I was trying to uh, figure out how you went from one to the other. Yeah, it was uh, something that I started to work with. The first thing that you did on your PhD and then- uh, Exactly, and then- uh, Okay, okay. And then I found a more interesting <laughs> okay, okay, topic. Okay, okay. okay, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Sounds good. Um, okay, fine. You know, I don't have any other questions. I will probably get some more tomorrow, right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you should keep the best for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> or you can, I mean, finish a defense now, and then you can say tomorrow, yeah, we're already ready, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay. So looking uh, forward for tomorrow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, do you have any other questions from my group? Hi, Christopher. Uh, if I may, I have a question. So I was wondering what kind of ships are you considering for, for, for these cases? Because when you say that an emergency maneuver is bring velocity to zero, and I think about uh, maybe tankers or so. It's not a maneuver that you can do maybe in a span of a few seconds. No, that's so maybe true. We, have, uh, we have been looking at ships that not these like really, really large ones where you have a stop maneuver would take like minutes to perform, but some not, but so uh, is that a feasible like emergency maneuver or like, you know, if it takes you minutes and. No, that, then I would say that I'm, it's not what we've been focused on here, but uh, I mean, they still need to, those type of ships need to have these emergency maneuvers as well, if they are about to be autonomous. And then you would have to design emergency maneuvers that takes really long time. And then you need to identify these in a really long time in advance before, before you take those decisions. You should have the crossing the Suez Canal example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The congestion in the Suez Canal example. Yeah, I should have added that one. <laughs> Try yeah. not to get well, stuck. I, yeah. <laughs> I think that what you 
perhaps alluded to in, in the answer to my question previously regarding this stop primitive. Hmm. Um, I mean, the entire planner system could be used to, to create such uh, maneuver uh, so, so that instead of um, instead of um, a primitive, it's it's a, an entire. Yeah, it could be a sequence um, of primitives. Yeah, but it also could be a solution that's that's uh, comes from the planner. Yeah, instead exactly. Of being and that, used in, 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 in instead of being just a primitive in the planner. Yeah, for sure. And then you could like okay, so when it's emergency mode, then you change your terminal state and you maybe a terminal region or something. You want to find solutions that takes the vehicle to to stop stop state at the in a, in a certain region so then i'm, I'm not sure if, if uh, fossen has any uh, examples of it in his book but uh, there are some some optimized maneuvers that exist actually mm -hmm. All right. So if there are no other questions, thank you, Christopher. Thank good, you very much. Good luck for tomorrow.